one. All right, hello everyone. Um, this is Sam and I'm here with uh, Brett Sockold. Uh, did I say that correctly, sorry? Yeah, Sockold. Sockold. Um, and so you are a, a Catholic theologian. Um, you live in Regina, Saskatchewan. And if I understand correctly, your current position is sort of like um, deaconate education, um, is that? Right, so I'm the archdiocesan theologian and a big part of my day-to-day -day work is that I run our deacon formation mm -hmm. program for the archdiocese. So um, we're not a big enough center that we have a theology faculty or a seminary. The closest mm -hmm. seminary is in Edmonton, which is like a 10 and a half hour drive or something. I mean, Canada is um, a big place. Yeah, Canada's big. <laughs> so uh, if you're a deacon, uh, we send our priests to Edmonton or like our seminarians who are going to be priests. But deacons are guys with families and day jobs typically mm -hmm. uh, who do their formation on evenings and weekends. So you can't be going to Edmonton uh, for evenings and weekends. So uh, a big part of my task here is to run our deacon formation program. Uh, but I do like dozens of other uh, things. Um, once you have a theologian on staff, you realize, like, it takes a couple of years. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, the theologian can do this, too. And so you get, sure. uh, you get different things uh, uh, thrown your way. Um, but, but, yeah, diaconate formation is, is, is the reason there's a line for me in the budget. Yes, yes. <laughs> cool. Um, and so you've recently written a book called Transubstantiation. Um, I don't have a paper copy. Yes, thank you. I have a, I have a Kindle copy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it is, I would say, really good and kind of, for me, it was mind blowing, I would say. Um, I, so my, my mom, I, I'm a, I'm a Unitarian and grew up Unitarian, but my mom grew up Catholic and um, okay. became Protestant around the time she started dating my dad. And so I have a lot of Catholic family. I've been to Catholic masses and first communions and funerals and um, weddings and all that sort of stuff. And I always understood um, transubstantiation or the Catholic teaching on the Eucharist to be, well, literal or physical or even perhaps chemical, you might even say, right, in right. terms of, of the, the transformation. And, and my mom did too right and that, that's mm. what she and she grew up in in the church and so that's what when she stopped believing that that's what she thought it was that she was you know leaving aside so right right to hear you say that that the the original um understanding and articulation uh from thomas aquinas and sort of that medieval time was not that was like oh right so, now, so well Go ahead. Yeah. So, well, just, so just a comment on, on um, vocabulary, right? So yes. um, whether it's literal or physical depends on what you mean by literal or physical. Right. And, so and real depends on, and, on and, what and you mean by real. And they're going to think, oh, this guy's a heretic. He's saying Christ isn't really present. Um, and, and so I, wa I want to qualify, right? So literal or physical presence is, is um, from a theological point of view, undefined terms. It's just hmm. never the language the church is used to define. And so you could say Christ is literally present and have an orthodox intention or a misapprehension. You could that's, say Christ is physically clear. present yeah. and have an orthodox intention or some misapprehension. So I, I, some people hear me, my own mother uh, keeps saying, I, but I, w I was sure he was really present. I'm like, no, mom, he is. <laughs> He is really, but physically and literally are not the categories that the church has, has used, and they can convey a misunderstanding. You use chemically, right? Right, if chemically, give, yeah. If they give you the impression that if you looked under a microscope, you would see something other than the, the physical elements of bread and wine, or sometimes you hear this stuff, right? Um, God would like convert it back or disguise it to you know, like prevent your prying eyes from from discerning what's really going on then you've ha then you have a misapprehension of what you know what you mean by literally or physically but what the church has said is really truly and substantially mm -hmm. um and that's and and when when we talk about transubstantiation the key term is substantially right uh yeah. and so i go into a lot of detail about what that means and the thing about substance 
in Thomas Aquinas is that it's not a physical reality. Substance is what is present to the mind, not what is present to the senses. Right. Um, but what is present to the mind is actually more real in a certain way, because what is present to the senses can shift. Like I can get a haircut or, or, I mean, I can, I can, I can go through a, an accident where I, I'm radically disfigured and unrecognizable uh, mm -hmm. from a physical point of view or, or almost unrecognizable. Right. I mean, you might have the dentist look at the molds of my teeth or something, but, um, but my, my core, uh, thing that makes me me that is given by god that is present to the intellect that apprehends it through some interaction with the physical that's more real than the physical which can sh which can shift and change so right right and it's not but at the same time it's not just saying it's all in your head right it's it's um vis it's real to the intellect if not the senses but that's right. not saying that it's imaginary or just in your head yeah, so that, that would actually, I think the other really key term for the Catholic tradition, which is really, right, Christ mm -hmm. is really present. I think that if you go digging at how the church has used that term real, you can basically translate it as um, God is the actor. So it's even though the substance is what's present to the intellect, it doesn't mean that we are making Christ present by thinking about it the right way. It's not an act of the community agreeing to call this thing what we call it and then acting accordingly, which is, which is actually not nothing, right? That's what we do with the national flag. Right. Or like and, Thanksgiving, and, and, right? Like or, yeah, what, or what makes a Thanksgiving tradition. turkey is a Thanksgiving turkey because it's on the, you eat it on the Thursday in November and you're there with your family, et cetera. And so you're eating a Thanksgiving turkey. But you right. can't look under a microscope and say, this is, this a, turkey Thanksgiving. is a Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> right. right. So it's the human meaning making capacity is not nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when Catholics have said Christ is really present, we're saying it's more than that. It's, it's God's meaning making activity, God determining the reality of this that makes this presence in that sense real. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, substance is present to the mind, but it doesn't mean we're making things up. Right. right? Just like right. if I recognize you, uh, I'm recogn it's, it's happening in my mind that I'm recognizing you, but I'm recognizing something that's external to my mind mm -hmm. that, is that is real in itself and not just real because it's up here, right? Right, right. All right. Okay. Well, that I think was a really good introduction and important to get clarified kind of right off the bat. But um, cool. you, you also said that you had some, some questions for me to just better understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah. So, so you kind of asked me in our initial exchanges, and, and maybe we should give some props to P Paul Vanderclay. Yes. You're, you're a, a watcher of his YouTube channel, and I did a couple interviews with Paul on the book. Uh, so that's kind of how we met. Um, you got in touch with Paul who said, hey, Sam wants to get in touch with you. And, and the kind of the, the key question is, okay, you're a Unitarian. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know a lot about Unitarians, but you had asked me like, what kind of ecumenical dialogue is possible between Trinitarian Christians and, and non-Trinitarian Christians? Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know. Uh, and so my questions for you are kind of along that line. So I'm not an ex. Trinitarian theology is not my particular expertise. So I happen to know something about it as a Catholic theologian. Um, but I, I do have particular expertise in ecumenical dialogue. And the question, I think, for a theologian interested in dialogue when presented with Unitarian is, what category do we put this person or group in? Because mm -hmm. if I dialogue with a Muslim or a Jewish person, I'm doing inter- faith dialogue. If I dialogue with a Lutheran or a Calvinist, I'm doing ecumenical dialogue, right? I'm dialoguing with another person who I acknowledge as a Christian. Right. And part of the thing that we say we acknowledge when we're doing ecumenical dialogue with Lutherans or, or Calvinists or Anglicans or the Eastern Orthodox or anybody, uh, well, not anybody, <laughs> in any of those groups, we say, well, they believe in the Trinity, like that's one of the key, right? They believe in the incarnation. They believe in the Trinity. We have the first seven, seven councils often of the church we refer to uh, where this kind of stuff was hammered out. And so then we don't really know where to put a Unitarian. Like, are you something like, uh, 
uh, and I don't mean for you to answer this right now, I mean, this is the question in our head, something like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, which is, which uses Christian scriptures, but we don't call them Christian, but they call themselves Christian, like how does that fit? And so the, the only, nothing seemed to fit really well. And the best thing I could latch on to from my own experience of the, of the Christian tradition is um, during the first seven councils in the early church, there, there were groups of Eastern mm -hmm. Christians, so like the Assyrian church, that did not sign on to the Council of Chalcedon. Right. It's kind of the finalization of our doctrine of Christ as fully human and fully divine, and then the implications that has for the Trinity. And we still call them Christians. And in fact, we reached remarkable breakthroughs in mutual understanding in the last hundred years with them after, after like centuries and centuries of sort of mutual estrangement right on <laughs> like on 1500 kind of years worth of yeah. estrangement right yeah like way more than protestants and catholics right um so that's my jumping off point is like um dialogue with a unitarian might be possible if it's something like that uh if it's something like so the question that an ecumenist always wants to ask and here's where i get to my questions for you is Okay, you say you don't believe in the Trinity, but I want to know when you say that, what do you mean to affirm and what do you mean to deny? Because right? yes. I can just say, oh, they don't believe in the Trinity, so I have, I have no truck with that. That's not Christianity. Um, but the Trinity is actually a really complicated thing, and there's a pretty good chance you affirm some things that I affirm, mm -hmm. and, and other things that you don't affirm, I might at least want to... Um, make sure that my own people aren't misunderstanding it because it might be a confusing thing, right? So right. anyways, that's kind of, that's the question I put to you is like, when you say you don't believe in the Trinity, uh, what are you affirming and denying in the, because that, that's, a, that's a really tight, short little statement. It must have a massive sort of background behind it that needs unpacking. Right, yes. Well, first off, I want to say that one, one of the things I really enjoyed about your book and your talks with Paul and the other things that I interacted with you is that you have a very patient and under, uh, you know, curious um, approach to these topics. So, so that's one of the reasons why I was, I was excited to talk to you. It's not cool. always easy to find um, even people that will go as far as you just did in the last couple minutes. So, um, like with regards to say, you know, like the Coptic Orthodox Church or the Armenians or the Nestorians, right, who were, who would sign on to Nicaea and Constantinople, but not Chalcedon, um, okay. right, they would still call themselves Trinitarians. They would just say that the particular details or language of the Council of Chalcedon didn't get the incarnation right, but they mm -hmm. would still self-identify as, as Trinitarians. Right. So, so th this is why I'm even perhaps a little bit further from that. And, right. and why I, I would this... expect, but it was the closest jumping off point I could find. Right. Yeah. So from your perspective, I'm probably cl a lot closer to you than Mormons or Jehovah's Witness, right. but maybe not even quite as close as say the Nestorian Church of the East or, or something like that. Okay. Um, so Unitarianism really has its birth, or we would say rebirth, as a theology uh, in the Reformation, right? Sort of the radical end of the Anabaptist wing of the Re of Reformation um, started to not believe in the Trinity anymore in the early 1500s, and really not that long after um, uh, things got rolling. And so, uh, so there, there's liberal Unitarianism, which is sort of like Unitarian Universalism, which most people are familiar with, and whether or not you classify that as a Christian religion, they might not even classify themselves as a Christian religion anymore, really. Right. They're, it's sort of like a post-religious religion or something like that. Right, right. Um, yeah, we, we have a, a, a group in Regina. I actually, I actually went and gave a talk there once mm -hmm. uh, while, we, while our society was debating what to do about assisted suicide when our Supreme Court struck down the law prohibiting it. So I gave the Catholic, you know, uh, fervorino against assisted suicide yeah. to, to this group, uh, many of whom were in favor of assisted suicide, but who also are, are committed in principle to listening to people 
who don't necessarily share their commitments. So yes. they're an interesting, and they also got all my Star Trek jokes. <laughs> they're lovely people. I, I've had <laughs> interactions with the Unitarian Universalists. They're perfectly friendly. Right, um, right. So I'm, but that's not I, you. That's not me. So we represent sort of like the conservative wing of Unitarianism that really kind of, we're not even like one denomination. Unitarian Universalism, Universalism is a denomination. Um, okay. Like biblical Unitarianism, as we often call ourselves, is more like a confederation of lots of different groups who seem to come to similar conclusions on these matters, often pretty independently. So okay. like there are some biblical Unitarians who came out of Baptist stuff, some who, you know, came out of sort of more, I don't know, charismatic backgrounds or, or this, that, or the other thing where some pastor will like read his Bible and be like, yeah, the Trinity just doesn't make sense anymore. I think it's kind of like this. And then the internet has made it a lot easier for us to find ourselves. And there really is sort of like a, a growing um, self-awareness of each other emerging mainly because of the internet right, um, right. that is sort of enabling the growth of what we what's often called biblical Unitarianism or Christian Unitarianism sometimes. So, so, uh, so we point back to early church fathers that would normally be classified as heretical church fathers from the early couple centuries who seem to have believed what we believe and we claim that our Christology, our alternative Christology, is really the original sort of biblical and apostolic teaching, and that things sort of got off track uh, and then uh, died away, and then in the Protestant Reformation finally came back, is really sort of our, our self-understanding. Okay. So that's sort of like history, but that, so, that, I didn't describe any of the content right. of the doctrine. So right, but it, well, it gives me. Go ahead. Well, yeah, it gives me a couple questions. I mean, one thing that strikes me is if people are coming up with this independently, um, there's probably a handful of scriptural passages that are sort of grouped together as sort of central for your understanding. And, yes. <laughs> and 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 then some people are going to discover some church fathers who read things that way sort of after the fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might have some people who read these church fathers and say, oh, they had it right. But it sounds more like some people are just reading their Bible and then they're like, oh, some other Christians, both living today and living 18, 1900 years ago, seem to read it the way that makes sense to me. Right. Right. And so because that's happening convergently a lot, there does seem to be and we would also point that a lot of sort of like higher criticism and sort of like the kind of the historical Jesus camp and stuff like that, sort of like the Bart Ehrmans of the world, actually seem to say that the earliest Christology looks more like what we believe, even though we believed this before Bart Ehrman and sort of a lot of his peers sort of stumbled upon it, like Larry Hurtado also seems to be another sort of one of the, he recently passed away, one of those um, sort of early church historian sort of people who seems to say, actually, you know, this, the earliest versions of, you know, uh, Christology seem to look more like this. And then we're like, well, we've been saying that since like, you know, 1550 and, and stuff like that. So, so that's sort of where we're coming from. So right. to give you an overview of what we think is with the Unitarianism is a word that is, was intentionally crafted in contrast to Trinitarianism, right? Unitarianism isn't a biblical word. It's not even right. like a word that you can find in the church fathers. And so we believe that just God the Father is the one person who is God and all of God is essentially God the Father and that he's the only eternal um, all-powerful being. So we will say then that Jesus is the son of God. We will affirm the virgin birth and the miracles and his death and his resurrection. But we will say um, that he was just a man, that he didn't have a divine nature or he wasn't one of the co-eternal persons of the Godhead or something like that that he had a very special relationship to God, that he revealed God and that he was empowered by God to do miracles and all those sorts of things. And that he was you know, chosen ahead of time before the foundations of the world. And 
we would say he pre-exists only in God's like foreknowledge, right? Like God knew about him ahead of time, but that wasn't like a personal active form of pre-existence. He really didn't exist in the real sense until um, he was conceived. Hmm. And so, hmm. and then now he's exalted. He's at the right hand of God. Um, you know, all authorities are being submitted to him and then he'll return again. So the basic gist of the narrative starting at the conception is really very similar. Um, and we have, we have the same, we don't have a special scripture book like, like Mormons do, nor do we have some secret sanctified translation that's hardly a translation at all like Jehovah's Witnesses do. We'll use the same Bible, same translation, same Greek text and stuff that, that mainstream Orthodox uh, Christians will use. Right, right. Would you say that your Christology would be something like what, like when I teach an intro, you know, doctrine of God course or, or Christology course, you would talk about adoptionist mm -hmm. Christologies in the early church. Would that be you? Yes, basically. Um, okay. We, we would say we wouldn't like lean into adoptionism because we don't think that there was like a hardcore wing of adoptionism, which was like God just looked down and saw Jesus who was li living so good and decided to make him his only begotten son. Right. That would okay. be, we wouldn't say that, like, we would say, you know, God, it, you know, did, um, you know, intend for all of this to happen. And it was all part of his plan. He didn't just notice Jesus and decide to adopt him, like some of the early adoptionists said. Okay. But so, the more moderate wing of the adoptionists would be us, basically. Yeah. Okay. And they, they also have the name um, uh, Dynamic Monarchians is another one of their okay. names in the original church period. And that, okay. that's, that's who, who we claim to be sort of in kinship with uh, across okay. through the ages. And so then here's, here's something that I think strikes me as really core for, well, a Catholic, but I would say probably any mainstream Trinitarian. What do you say about the worship of Jesus? Yeah, this is a good question. So this is where I'll be a little bit careful because, I, well, like part of like what I said about modern biblical Unitarianism is we're a loose confederation. So we have some of some disagreements internally based okay. off of some of these things. But the way that I understand it is that Jesus is to be worshipped um, okay. and that he is worthy to be bowed down to. Um, you can have a personal relationship with him and stuff like that, because God has exalted him to a place where he is deserving of such. And like some passages that we might use to kind of support that idea, like at the end of First Chronicles, there's a passage where David is passing the, the, um, the throne to Solomon. And in sort of that, that process, all of the assembly of Israel bows down to God and to the king right, sort of simultaneously. Okay. And bow down is the same word, right, as worship. And so we would say that, that Jesus is worthy of worship in the sense that he is God's, like, uh, right-hand man and sits on the throne of David eternally uh, as the Messiah and Christ. But there would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, a distinction between the worship offered to God and the worship offered to Jesus? Probably, yes. I, I, I make that distinction that like the worship that's given to Christ is still, it sort of ripples up to God the Father in the highest sense. Sort okay. of like in Philippians 2, which is ironically a verse that often gets quoted against uh, us, where every knee bows to Jesus, every tongue confesses that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? right. Like everyone is bowing to Jesus, recognizing his rulership. But God is sort of, in a sense, kind of the, the power above the throne itself. And so even the glory received by Jesus is worthy to him, but it still kind of ripples up. Right, right. I, so, like oh. one thing that I've said to help explain this to Catholic people before is that the way we think of Jesus is not unlike the way that Catholics think of Mary. I was starting to wonder about that. Yes. I mean, it's, it, it sounds to me like... Um, there's a closer relationship. Like we, we draw a pretty hard line right. between creature and creator. And we would say Mary is never worshiped as, as God. And so we, we like, we'll have careful distinctions to say like, you might venerate, but that's not worship. Or in, in Latin, we, we say dulia 
is due to the saints and Latria is due to God alone. Mm-hmm. And Mary gets hyperdulia, which is like, right. she's, like the, she's the, the greatest chief. of the saints, but it's yeah. categorically different than mm-hmm. what's offered to God. Um, and so it, I, I'm sensing some parallel between yeah. the Catholic approach to Mary and, and your approach to Jesus. But, but also I, f- I feel like uh, we, pr- well, and maybe there's differences in your camp, but it feels like we draw a hard, pretty hard line between, uh, like we won't even use the same word uh, right. for worship, you know, between Mary and, and God. Uh, and that line seems, at least in your particular case, not quite as hard. Right. It's not quite as hard. We might be willing to cross that. And right. so the, like, the scandalous thing to us that we're willing to accept is that God has made exalted a man to be worthy of worship alongside okay. himself, right? Like, you know, uh, the sort of the, the Catholic side is the scandal is that God becomes man, right? Mm-hmm. And, and like that he would come down to us, right? And like, you know, that might sound ridiculous, but that's, that's what we're saying. Whereas we're saying almost the opposite, right? The scandal for us is that God, that a man gets exalted to be on the throne with God. Right. And that right. that is shocking in a certain sense and a little bit unexpected. But also there are Old Testament passages that seem to allude to that happening, like Daniel 7 or, or Psalm 110 and stuff like that, where, where uh, some, one like the Son of Man or David's Lord gets put on the throne next to but still not he's not usurping god and still god is in a sense above him but seemingly brought into the throne room of god is a man and everything else all the angels all other powers are now subject to the man right right i got two two more questions on this go for it first is uh, first is um the holy spirit question mark? Oh, good question. Um, (laughs) So we think that the Holy Spirit is not like a person, right? We would say that it, we normally say it's like the, it's the spirit of God at work in the world or something like that. We wouldn't give it independent personship. It's not like a second God or something like that. It's like a power of God or an attribute of God that um, God uses to work in the world. So it may be in like there's Old Testament passages that talk about the spirit of God or mm-hmm. sometimes the angel of God, which right. almost seems to be like a proxy. For right. God. So it would be something, something it would, like it would be, that. Yeah, it would be something like that. Like yeah. the, it, the Holy Spirit gets personified, right? And it's like, the, it's the one who gives scriptural revelation, right? Mm-hmm. Like when, when prophets receive words of the Lord, it comes to them through the Holy Spirit. And now in the Christian age after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh, right? And all Christians get indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And it's sort of like this internal connection to God. And it's fine to talk about it in a personified way. And the Bible itself does that. But sometimes it's talked about in an impersonal way. So it's sort of like this quasi not quite personal, you know, activity or energy of of God at work in the world. Hmm. It's it's the spirit of God is really the way that, that we like to say it. So it's not a member of the Godhead. It's not worshipped because you can't, it's not like the sort of thing that could be worshipped. It's just a way of talking. Right. Yeah. Right. See, one of the things that I'd be curious about, but I'm not equipped to, to do this, uh, you know, uh, uh, do this work with you uh, right now. This isn't my area, but when I teach it, I, you know, I read about it just before I teach it. So I'm an expert for a week and then... <laughs> because I don't write on it and you know, it's not generally my area of study, then it doesn't stick. But one of the things that we, we do in, in an intro Trinity class is we sort of deconstruct the word person because the way the word person comes to be used in the early Christological debates and the Trinitarian theology um, actually leads in some strange convoluted route to the word person we use today in English. Yes. But it, it's not the same thing. No. And so we try to qualify it by saying it's something, what, what, what we're saying in the, in the ancient Trinitarian theology, it's not perfect, but the closest we might get in contemporary English would be something like relation. Yeah, I would even say entity, right? Like might be the word for hypostasis, that, that kind of, like 
an individual thing, but it doesn't need to have, you know, self-awareness and stuff like that, like the right, English right. word person. Which, right? yeah, I mean, when we hear person and, and we just translate straight from our everyday experience of persons, we, we end up with basically tritheism yeah. rather than Trinitarian theology. But if, if, if I was more equipped, I, I, you know, I might have more, but it, it, it strikes me that that might be a place for engagement with someone who actually really knows that stuff uh, to see how, how you guys uh, think about it. My last, my last uh, thing on, on this before we, we uh, move on to our other questions is it just strikes me that um, as a Catholic theologian, that this is much more likely to be a Protestant phenomenon. Like I'm not aware at all of Catholics, you know, reading the scriptures this way and then being like, oh, this early uh, Christological heresy actually makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I mean, using the language we would use. And it seems, it seems at least in part, because Catholics have a, a pretty clear and, and comfortable, we're comfortable with the idea of doctrinal development mm -hmm. in, the, in the early church. And so when we say, we see something like an adoptionist Christology in the early church, I mean, we wouldn't deny for a second that it's there, uh, you know, and that you have real historical antecedents, but we would be like, um, but it was found unsatisfying for a reason uh, at the time. And, and it, it, and when I teach early Christology, I mean, basically the pattern is something like, um, okay, this Jesus's relationship to God is a bit mysterious and scripture can be read in more than one way. And we have early church fathers reading it and fighting with each other about it. And then someone makes a proposal that, that accounts for some of the data, but, but necessarily um, then chooses to ignore other bits of the data. And then when the rest of the tradition is faced with that, they say, well, yeah, they got this thing right. But then because they went in that direction, they necessarily missed this thing. And there's this sort of careful winnowing back and forth uh, until actually after Chalcedon, really the final question is um, uh, how many Monoph wills? Yeah, monophit or uh, what not, not fissos. Monophilitism. Um, and then what's, what, what's the Greek word for will? Right. Well, th thela, I don't oh, know. Yeah. 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 So you have mm -hmm. monophysitism, one nature right. that's earlier and that gets sort of winnowed out. But then the final question is even after Chalcedon and it's how many wills does Jesus have? Right. Um, and monotheletism says he has one will, the divine will. And that's, that's ruled out of court. Right. In, in fact, Jesus does have a human will and a divine will mm -hmm. uh, ends up being the Orthodox position, but, Anyways, that just shows how fine grained this gets. Yeah. Um, but there's this sort of like someone makes a pitch that accounts for some of the data and misses other parts of the data. So then the tradition sort of self corrects. But sometimes there's this sort of overshoot, and it's almost like a pendulum that sort of slowly comes to rest, sort of even well after Chalcedon. But Catholics in general are just comfortable with with this sense of development of doctrine and and trusting that the spirit is with the church in that discernment. And so when we look at, you know, an early adoptionist Christology, we're like, yeah, that was, that was part of the sorting out process. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't take, and you know, here we are where we are, whereas it seems much more likely that at least some Protestants would read scripture and find a given reading of it compelling, and then go back to the early church and say, hey, that guy read it like I do. He, he, yeah. he must have had something. Mm -hmm. and, and so it just seems the, the, the possibility of the Unitarianism you describe looks from Catholic eyes like a Protestant phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And I would say that's very much true. Like uh, a common ingredient of all of the different um, kind of strains that have come together in biblical Unitarianism is the idea that like earlier is better, right? This sort of re rejection of the idea of development rejection of the idea of the a church magisterium or something having some sort of authority on this matter and that the earlier the closer you can get to the new testament teaching the closer you can get to the original apostolic age the better sort of and then everything is downhill from there and it's always right. this uphill battle to get back to um first origins 
right? right? And this is a common thing in some parts of, of Protestantism. And in the Protestant Reformation, there was sort of like the, the magisterial wing, like Calvin and Luther, who still had a lot of respect for Augustine and still had a lot of respect for the patristic age. And they were like, man, we need to shed back, but maybe just shed off the Middle Ages to get back to like the patristic period, right? Right. And then there was the Radical Reformation, which was like the Anabaptists in them, who were like, we need to go all the way back to the Book of Acts, right? right. And so you get the Anabaptists who are living in sort of com communes together, sharing all their goods, because in the Book of Acts, they shared all things in common. We're going right. to do that, right? And then you get sort of the doctrinal version of that, which is Unitarianism, which is like, Trinity is not in the Bible, never says that. What they right. believe originally, let's do our best to reconstruct this thing. Let's look at the earliest church fathers and try and do our best to make sense of the New Testament data. Uh, well, here we are, Unitarianism, some, right. some version of quasi-adoptionism again. So, so you and I are basically like arch enemies. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, is if we know where we disagree, then it makes it easier to talk. <laughs> well, then, oh, uh, yeah, exactly. But I mean, but, our, but the methods of our respective traditions are yes. really quite... Um, opposed. I mean, if, if, we, if we start moving towards the book, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, uh, uh, a mainstream Trinitarian Protestant will say to me, oh, transubstantiation is not in the Bible. And I'll say, well, yeah, neither is the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> the, and for the, me, the, all the worse for the Trinity. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah, for you, you're like, good, okay. But, but the, the, the way that rhetoric, that rhetorical move works or is supposed to work against a normal Trinitarian Protestant is Look, there are questions that Scripture raises, um, and and it is quite possible to read it in more than one direction. Uh, you know, if you want to privilege one set of texts over another set of texts, or or if you have this philosophical set of lenses going in rather than this other philosophical set of lenses, and so certain questions are raised for the Christian community by the witness of the Scriptures that need to get sorted out over time and the the biggest one actually is the identity of jesus uh and so the 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 single biggest question the one that gets dealt with with the most energy and and the earliest in the sense is the question of jesus's identity in relationship to the father which leads to the doctrine of the trinity but we are also faced with questions about what does what does jesus's claim you know this is my body how are we mm -hmm. to understand that um and as I show in the book, right, that question doesn't become pressing for the church in the early time because the basic philosophical categories weren't, didn't make that question problematic. Right. But fast forward 900 years and the, cat the philosophical categories start to shift. Now that question becomes problematic for the Christian community. They're forced to answer it in a more careful, articulate, sort of systematic way. And, and the end result of that after like, 200 plus years is the doctrine of transubstantiation but but what i say to a, a protestant is the basic pattern of the scriptural data forces a question on the christian community that has to be answered with reference to um philosophical categories and making sure we're reading all the data uh and, and not, you know, abandoning certain elements in favor of others and, and checking our biases and all that kind of stuff. The process that gets you Trinity is the same process that gets you transubstantiation. Catholics are very comfortable with that process, you know, continuing. As you said, the magisterial Protestants were good with that for, you know, the first seven councils. Mm -hmm. We're good with the process continuing to that point. And the Unitarian says, uh, I'm not sure about this whole process. <laughs> that seems arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe we can make common cause against the, the mainstream. <laughs> At least we're consistent. Right. Uh, we're, you, you, we're, I you guys are stuck in between and it doesn't, I'm not sure if that's a stable place you can land. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's funny. Um, oh, shoot. One thing that I think is interesting and that your your book made me made me think about a lot is sort of how the metaphysics underneath theology sometimes changes and sometimes it can change pretty abruptly and pretty pretty seismically. 
right and that the the same words carry through but suddenly the words have taken on different meanings right it can slip people's notice that that has what happened and so you end up with using the same words as a couple centuries ago or a millennium ago or more but your thought world is so different that it is really saying and communicating something very different in your new context and a thing that I notice is that the earlier the version of Trinitarianism that I'm interacting with, the less problem I have agreeing with some parts of it. So like when I talk with 21st century um, evangelical Trinitarians, like I had a debate recently with such a person, Chris Date, um, and like, man, we look miles apart, right? It looks just completely irreconcilable. And then when I go back and I read further back, like Augustine, I'm like, man, I understand a lot more of what you're saying and can agree a lot more with it, Augustine, than this 21st century Trinitarian. And when I go back and then I read Athanasius, I'm like, actually, and Athanasius is even better, in my opinion, than, um, than Augustine and stuff like that. Although I like the Arians a little bit better than the, the Athanasians. Uh, but right. yeah, you but would. like, <laughs> I would, yes. Although I will qualify, I'm not exactly an Arian either. They're they're a little bit different. In my in my opinion, you Arians and Trinitarians are so close. You just had minor disagreements, um, <laughs> which is a bombshell. I know because yeah, some right. people think so Arianism well. is the opposite of Trinitarianism. For me, it's like it's just pretty close. Um, but like the further back in time I go, the better I can understand it and the less problem I have with it. And sometimes I wonder if like, you sort of made the point that, that Luther and especially Calvin in reacting against sort of the, the a version of transubstantiation that had actually mutated away from its original sort of Thomistic understanding, Calvin in reacting against it actually in a way sort of unrealizingly corrected it. And sometimes, or maybe I don't or mean to put words. Corrects the misinterpretations of it. Corrects the misinter. Right. Yeah. He 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 notices the shift in metaphysics, and but he he doesn't realize he doesn't he he knows something's off. Right. He, something right. is not is not jiving. So he ends up correcting back to the earlier version without realizing it. And yeah. sometimes I wonder if we Unitarians have something to teach you Trinitarians because we have done something sort of similar in that I think that the modern version of the Trinity has a lot more problems and complications with it because it's sort of like a over-literalized version of the original doctrine, sort of like transubstantiation started to get over-literalized, over-concretized, over-physicalized in a right. certain way uh, by the time of the Reformation. So, I mean, so that's interesting. So when you said that, it, it, it kind of pinged something in me that's, that, like, why, why do I, as a traditional Catholic Trinitarian believing theologian, why would I have a conversation with a Unitarian? Mm -hmm. and part of the reason why I'm just inclined to such dialogue, it's almost temperamentally, but, but intellectually as well, is that... Um, I find that when you when you have a discussion with a person of goodwill, even if you end up, you know, radically disagreeing with them, they force you to clarify what you actually think. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that um, in general, we know so little about what we're talking about when we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, that being challenged on it might force us to consider um, what's going on. And, and I, I think there have been movements sort of semi-regularly in the history of theology of trying to, trying to come to terms with how um, the categories have shifted or sometimes it's the undue influence of one thinker. You know, that's a, that's a standard kind of move where, um, you know, uh, well, I mean, a really common one is Augustine and original sin, right? So you'll mm -hmm. have You'll have, I mean, the East is quite critical very often of Augustine on original sin, but even Western thinkers will be like, maybe we got off track here and we could find some more gold in the original scriptural witness if we took these inherited lenses off for a bit. That doesn't mean we don't think Augustine had anything to teach us. 
but maybe we're just not able to see things clearly with all the sort of residue of history built up. Mm -hmm. And so for the Catholic, there's a fine line because on the one hand, there's certain what looks to Protestants like residue of history, which is like dogmatically required of us, right? But that doesn't mean that we don't think that that actually happens, right? So sometimes we, we think the church does the discernment and led by the Holy Spirit. This thing, which is built up for different historical reasons or whatever, gets nailed down. But not everything gets nailed down. Mm -hmm. And so we can still say, yeah, it's worth, it's worth hearing what someone who doesn't have those lenses, but who's trying to read scripture honestly uh, can say. And I, and I, I, I think a Unitarian could probably at, at, at least help a modern, um, let's say your average mm -hmm. Trinitarian Christian today recognize that not everything they think they know about the Trinity is, is what the church has always taught. Right. Um, because it's really easy for those, and, and this is what happens with transubstantiation, right? People think they know what it means. And then it gets challenged from within the tradition, right? Uh, someone like Calvin says, well, this can't be right. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, so for Calvin, it's very explicit. He's like, that doesn't look like Augustine to me. Mm -hmm. Now for Thomas, Thomas wants to look like Augustine. He, mm -hmm. he references him all the time. He's a great student of, a, of Augustine. Um, he adds some interesting nuance to some of Augustine's things that I think are, are helpful. Um, but Aquinas would be scandalized to find out that 300 years later, someone would think he didn't look like Augustine. Right. And, and, and so Calvin says, well, this doesn't look like Augustine to me. Let's get back to Augustine. Uh, and what he ends up getting is much more like Aquinas than he himself could have recognized mm -hmm. um, because Aquinas's articulation had become unrecognizable because of the historical developments. And in particular, what I go through in the book is th there's, there's a really key thing. Sometimes it's harder to trace, right? Some these things are really slippery. There's a real key move here in late medieval uh, uh, philosophy, really, where substance, which we talked about at the very beginning, which means that which is present to the intellect for Thomas, by the time of the Reformation, it, substance has become one more accident yeah. it, it is now that which is present to the senses which is how you and i use the word today right right i mean if, if, if i'm a if i'm a detective on a crime scene this is plastic substance right yeah there's a plastic substance there was a there was a white you know powdery substance at the crime scene whatever right uh, yeah. we mean something very physical by by that term which is what it had come to mean uh by the time of the reformation and so it was unable to do the job that Aquinas had enlisted it for in the first place. And then, then people like Luther and Calvin both had to find other ways of saying the same thing. So one of the big things I try to show in my book is Aquinas and Luther and Calvin have roughly the same intention. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to set up like some boundary categories, everyone wants to say, God is the actor here. Christ is really present to his people. And they also want to say, um, this is not a magic trick. This is not some clandestine chemical transformation. Um, everybody wants to say those things. As a Catholic, I'm going to say, Luther, when he screws up, gets closer. And this is surprising to Catholics who don't know this, because we think all Protestants just think it's a symbol. You know? mm. It's just total mischaracterization of Protestantism. Um, it's true of some Protestants, but, mm -hmm. but to tar Luther with that brush makes no sense. When Luther goes off the rails, he gets too close to the physicalist, clandestine chemical kind of transformation uh, and loses the handle a bit on the sacramental end of the spectrum. And when Calvin loses the handle, he, he holds on to the sacramental symbolic sort of pole and loses the handle on the, 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 the real, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so what I propose, I, I, didn't, I didn't know when I started writing the book I was going to do this. By the end of the book, my proposal, which is quite bold, I think, is that Thomas could help Lutherans and Calvinists understand each other. Yeah. Because Cal uh, Thomas manages to hit this balance in a way that 
that um, holds the center where, where Calvin is tempted to fall off to one side and Luther is tempted to fall off to the other. And one of the interesting things historically is that this question is the first divide in the Reformation camp is on real presence. Yeah. Um, it's not Calvin because he's a second generation reformer. Luther and Zwingli um, uh, split on this. The Swiss and the German camps can't hold together because Luther says Christ is really present in the Eucharist and Zwingli says, no, it's just a, a symbol. That's oversimplified, but mm -hmm. makes the point. And then, and then they can't, hold common witness together and the fracturing of, of uh, Protestantism uh, starts almost immediately after Protestantism becomes a thing and continues to this day. And, and Christ's real presence in the Eucharist was the very first question on which yeah. Protestants divided. And I say, look, Cal uh, Thomas can help <laughs> you guys. Um, uh, irony of ironies but yeah <laughs> yeah right it, it, it is it, fe it, it feels almost too bold when I wrote it but then I was like I felt like it was almost by the time I was done the book like it was undeniable uh-huh uh-huh um, I don't know could how you, it to you I I thought so 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 part of uh, I'll explain some of my motivations for really wanting to talk to you so Unitarians are almost always more Zwinglian than Zwingli super, super on the, the symbol end. And honestly, my church really didn't take communion very seriously or the Lord's Supper very seriously growing up. We did it once a month, once a quarter. And like, honestly, if it hadn't been commanded in the Bible to do it, we wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have done it. And even when we were doing it, we didn't exactly know why, we just knew that we were supposed to. And like, it's a, it's a symbol, right? It's a symbolic remembrance. Okay, well, why are you eating it and drinking it? Like, you know, what's, you don't need to eat and drink it to pick up on a symbolism. Uh, right. so, so part of me is that I feel like I've been moving in a more real direction in, on understanding of the sacraments. And part of it is that same Unitarian, that same Radical Reformation motive. Well, how did the original apostles understand this? How did the early church understand this? If we're going to go back to the original understanding on all of these things, let's not leave the Lord's Supper behind. And that I think that a lot of Unitarians have inherited mere Zwinglianism without really knowing why it is that they came to think that way and without going through the process and asking the question on this doctrine the same way we have done on other doctrines. Mm. And I think that you have a lot to teach us in that regard. So part of my goal is to help uh, encourage some other Unitarians to rethink this because this is something that I almost never hear any of them really talk about or take seriously. And it's worth noting that in the 1500s, this was the topic, right? right. This right. was the center thing between, within Protestantism and between Catholics and Protestants. And it was a big deal. And it wasn't just silly that it was a big deal. Right. Because to us, us being sort of, and I can even lump in a lot of evangelicals under this, is that to, you know, to kind of modern Zwinglians, modern just, it's just a symbol. It's like, it seems ridiculous to fight right. over this. Like, isn't this is obvious guys, it's a symbol, get over it. And right. so like, I, I was reading again, John six and the other relevant passages in the Bible today. And I don't know how you get mere, mere symbolism out of John six, if you take it seriously. Right, right. Uh, so, so that is really one of the reasons why I'm eager to talk to you is I feel like I have a lot to learn from you and I am sort of gently elbowing some of my other Unitarians to pay attention. So, okay, so this is delightful because I would never have guessed. I mean, the thing about writing a book is you just send it out there and you don't know what's going to happen with it, right? Um, the idea that my book might help Unitarians help other Unitarians recover a more sacramental imagination and a more realistic approach to the Eucharist. And that's like, that's like the cherry on top. Like that's, <laughs> like that's well, fantastic. We can thank Paul Vanderclay too for serving as right. an intermediary. So how about, um, how do you f define the word sacramental? Because I know a lot of Protestants will just hear the word sacramental and say, that's one of those magical Catholic words that we don't use. 
So right. what does sacramental mean? Right. Uh, yeah. So it, there's, this, there's, the, there's this deep sense in the Catholic imagination that creation itself is revelatory, right? So that, that uh, you know, there's, this, uh, what is the, we love this line from Gerard Manley Hopkins. I'm not going to get it right, but Gerard Manley Hopkins is a Jesuit poet uh, who, who, um, talk, who, who has this great sense of God's grandeur being everything in, being imbued in God's, you know, grandeur and, and seeing God present in any lists, you know, the, the, the fish and the trees and the, there's, there's, oh shoot, what's the line? Uh, Praise be to God for dappled things, I think is the thing. Anyways, you can fi- we can find the poem later, but it's, it's this real Catholic sense that, that creation is imbued with God's uh, glory. And so something like the baptism in the Jordan, it would be, it would be typical Catholic uh, uh, sensibility to say that water is, was always meant for that. And that when Jesus goes down into that water, he, he hallows all water uh, for that purpose henceforward, you know. Um, and that um, when we eat together uh, as the body of Christ at the Eucharist, um, we're doing something that, that was supposed to be the way things were from the beginning, right? That meals starting in the Garden of Eden would be communion with God and with one another. Uh, it's not arbitrary to 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 eat together. Like this is this is a thing that has always brought humans together, and that's because that's the way God made us, right? Mm. Um, and it's the way He made the world. And so there's a sense in which there's a sacramental valence to everything, and then in a in a broken world, we miss it. We we don't apprehend creation the way it was created. And so we need reminding. Uh, we need to, um, and, and God gives us, so in the one sense that the, the world is sacramental and our engagement with the sacramental because everything speaks of the glory and the beauty of God. But on the other hand, um, in response to our, our brokenness, our estrangement from God, God in Christ designates specific physical elements, water, oil, bread, wine, um, uh, words, activities, rituals that, that um, are where we will find, uh, you know, Christ, God in Christ. And um, I mean, one of the things is, is there, won't, there's, there won't be sacraments in heaven. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they would, it it will have been fulfilled, you know, sacraments are kind of necessary in this interim between the fall and, and, and the final glory. Uh, they wouldn't, sacraments wouldn't have been necessary in the garden before the fall either, uh, because everything that they give us was already present to us through, through sort of the ideal normal means. So that is, there's this sense that of the goodness of creation and God's presence and accessibility through creation, but then also a sense that in our fallen state, uh, we we don't access that the way we were meant to, and so God gives us these particular gifts in the in in the seven sacraments in particular. Although Catholics don't limit their imagination to this to just the seven, they have a special status. Um, but we do all kinds of things that we call sacramental, whether that means lighting candles or praying with beads or. Um, washing feet on holy thursday or i mean there's there's literally hundreds of catholic practices that engage with this sense of god being present to us through ritual nature uh, physical artifacts anything like that yeah some ways some ways that i think that have kind of helped wake me up to sort of this idea is thinking about what are some secular equivalents of sacraments that we don't think are silly at all, right? Hmm. Like, um, like one that I think of is like a college graduation or something like that, mm-hmm. right? Where you wear a big funny gown and then you like march around and you get given a sheet of paper and like it's this big fancy day and you're doing it with a whole bunch of people at the same time and afterwards you're a college graduate, right? It's like, Words don't always have the effect on our soul 
that we expect them to. We can't right. just propositionalize down into ourselves to change ourselves in all the ways that we always want or expect. I can't just say, Sam, stop being hungry or, or something like that, you know, like, or I can't, Sam, be a better person, right? Uh, you know, Sam, stop, stop being jealous of this, that, or that, right? Like we can't, we can't reach into ourselves and change ourselves in that sort of way. And then there are these big moments where there are big changes in our life, like a wedding is a perfect example, right? And this is, this is actually one of those things where there's the secular sacrament and it's still an official church sacrament. Mm -hmm. Like when, when you get married, you need to change your identity. You need to change the way you think about yourself. You need to change the way you act and you change the way you're oriented to the, your spouse. You change the way you're oriented to your family, her family, you know, all those things, right? And so, like, how do we try and get that change deep into you, right? Like, how do we get into you that you're married? We go through all of this pomp and circumstance, and the, the, the trappings of the occasion awaken something in you that helped cause that change to happen, right? Right, right? in a way that just you talking couldn't do it, right? right? And Aquinas actually, Aquinas starts in, in the third part of the Sum, I think it's question 60 or so, before he gets to specific sacraments, when he's talking about sacraments in general, he basically says, if God is going to communicate with humans, he has to do it through the ways that humans interpret the world. Right. Uh, right. Which is a lot, I think lines up a lot with what you say, right? This is the kind of thing humans are. This is how they encounter reality. This is how they are changed. This is how they grow. This, right. And so if God is going to encounter us, that's how he's going to do it. And the, the, the preeminent sacrament in that sense is the incarnation, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that if God is going to get to us, he has to come to our level and interact with us as the kinds of things we are. Um, I mean, you know, Thomas will say, you know, God could have done things differently if if he wanted to you know we we don't limit god's if god wanted to save us by snapping god's fingers god could uh in some sense but thomas says but it's fitting that god proceeded well first of all we know that god proceeded the way god did proceed because uh we have the witness of of scripture and and the church and whatever else and so granted what we know about how god did proceed which we wouldn't have guessed on our own Mm -hmm. we can look at the logic of it and see how it's fitting mm -hmm. and um and so sacraments and the incarnation itself are to thomas are fitting ways for god to approach us given what we know about the kinds of things we are right 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 like another example that i think is funny like so imagine two friends are really good friends and they sort of like want to celebrate their like they want to make their felt their friendship real right they feel like their friendship is so important to them that they need to do something to like either demonstrate that or or, or just you know acknowledge that and so they get like matching tattoos or something like that right like i feel like that's sort of like a a, a secular example of like the sacramental urge or, or something like that. Like, right. oh, we need to do, we need to go through some action, preferably that's really permanent and changes us to like sort of m fully realize what we both are acknowledging is happening or something like that. Right. Right? right. It's like, it's like bringing it, I don't know, from the imagination. It's like trying to act it out in a way that makes it as real in the world as it seems to be mentally or something like right. that. Well, I thought of two examples while you're talking. The one is, I thought you might use this example before you said matching tattoos is the, is the practice of like slitting the palm of your hand, right? So you're both bleeding and mm -hmm. then shaking hands with these open wounds on your palms, right? Um, I mean, people are obviously trying to do something very profound when they do that. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a, and which got me thinking like, okay, that's a little... There's something that feels a little wrong. I mean, there, there's the human striving, but there's also something that seems, seems a little off about cutting yourself, right? And which made me think of the next example, which is hazing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So sports teams in the military or whatever. Or fraternities, yeah. Fraternities, 
people want to ritualize this in a in a let's say in a very impactful way yes but the human um and this is where we get into right our our sinful condition means that our attempts at deep meaning making can go off the rails yes and can become destructive exploitative etc and so one of the things that i think sacraments do within a christian context is um they 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 should give us lenses for seeing false sacraments yes right so so like college hazing gone wrong is like a sinful fallen broken version of the sacramental urge or the sacramental instinct which in itself is good and is supposed to point us to god but if we make our fraternity membership something more important then it's like a it's like an idol idolatrous sacramentality or something like that and there's a very specific sacrament that it's analogous to or falsely analogous to right it's an initiation right it's confirmation essentially (laughs) yeah right It's, (laughs) it's like a confirmation um and but it's it's a confirmation gone wrong you know yeah. Yeah. um and so it's um and even way back too to much drinking <laughs> well <laughs> way too right? much drinking of wine yeah i mean while we even put you know the three sacraments of initiation like baptism confirmation eucharist if you receive them as an adult in the catholic church you get them all at once mm-hmm. and you could see a, a sort of frat party with hazing as this sort of like yeah like terrible um parody of an easter vigil right yes yeah yeah something that no 19 year old college kid probably ever put together but yeah it's it's there that that's that's a very interesting thing i think that helps make this more real to people who are like what are you guys talking about well so so if so connecting this back to the eucharist so for most people they'll say well either it's symbolic or it's borderline physicalist cannibalistic and right. they they don't see or understand or even have a framework to talk about a third option, right? right. And also, I should say, you, you might want to point out that you're not saying it's not symbolic, but right. you're not saying it's, you're just saying it's not just or, or simply symbolic. Yeah, and yeah, this is, a, this is a problem Catholics get themselves into because we want to deny that it's merely symbolic, by mm-hmm. which we mean what we talked about at the beginning. It's only happening in your head. Mm-hmm. right like a like a national flag or something um the community meaning making right uh, that's that's what thomas will say is that that is um well okay i'm paraphrasing him a bit he won't say exactly this but he says something like um human meaning making is the arena into which god acts Right, so human meaning making is is we shouldn't dismiss it as not part of the sacrament. Human meaning making is what we do, and it's where God says He's going to show up. But the point is that God is the one doing the meaning making here, which means it hits reality at a deeper level than what right. you and I do if we agree to get matching tattoos or honor the same national flag and sing the same national anthem or or whatever else we might do as humans to make something meaningful. Um, God is doing something uh, in the in the arena of human meaning making. So it is symbolic, but it's but it's more than symbolic. Um, and the right the 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 danger for the contemporary person, but it was already the danger for the ninth century person. It wasn't a danger so much in the early church when the metaphysics didn't lend themselves to this. Mm-hmm. But when the metaphysics start to shift away from Platonism in Western Europe, um, the temptation becomes, if I want to say this is really real, which is clearly what's going on in the witness of the church to this point and in the scriptures, then I need to say it's physical Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the really real is the physical. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, it's, it's that impulse that leads to transubstantiation because one group says to be really real, it's got to be physical. And they start saying things that sound like cannibalism. And then the other group says that can't be right because that's not how the fathers talk. And that's not particularly Augustine. That that, that's not how Augustine talks. So that can't be right, but they're caught in the same trap. They think to be really real is to be physical. And so they say, I guess it's not really real. Yeah. 
and so this thing which for 900 years everyone thought was really real now becomes either uh real but misconstrued as physical or not real right um and and the goal of transubstantiation is sort of to put humpty dumpty back together again it's to give us new language to say this is really really real and it's not physical because there is a reality if you if you would just attend to how you think about things in general uh, which is what substance is a category for doing right sugar is a substance mm -hmm. um milk salt wood i mean these are substances if you think about how you think about those things you will realize that you think that they have a deeper reality than their physical reality mm -hmm. um, and if you recognize that then you can have some thing to latch on to for thinking about how how the eucharist is christ's real presence without it being a physical transformation that right. that's maybe in in short the work transubstantiation is trying to do and and i i argue in the book i think it does it very successfully it becomes the sort of touchdown for touchstone for catholic reflection on this because it succeeds but it also undergoes its own transformation later when the when the word substance stops functioning the way it was supposed to and so needs to be recovered so transubstantiation works really well if you're understanding it correctly but it itself can be misunderstood and then needs to be looked at again with with fresh lenses right right that 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 makes good sense so like aluminum right aluminum is a substance that at least our modern parlance but like you know if i said show me what aluminum is well you could well i could show you things that are aluminum i could find you a soda can i could find you a the the, the body of a pickup truck or you know whatever it was right. and i could say all these things are aluminum uh, well what's the, where is aluminum itself right, right. and we realize it's like a math uh, a scientific mathematical abstraction that we use to make sense of what we're seeing and we're calling it true in some deep sense i'm not saying that that i'm not saying aluminum doesn't exist but you know it's it's a it's an element on the periodic table and stuff like that but at the end of the day we don't ever interact with aluminum in it in its essence right, right. we we interact with soda cans and um and pickup trucks and stuff like that and actually, so there's, I don't, I, I don't go into a ton of detail on this in the book, but I, I mentioned it a little bit. In like the 40s, there was a big Catholic, um, I don't know, brouhaha around transubstantiation because someone said, um, look, substance is no longer a meaningful context for us because now we know actually we can encounter aluminum, not just in cans and pickup trucks, but we know about molecules and atoms. Mm -hmm. And because we know that there is such thing as aluminum atoms, we will say that that is, is aluminum per se. That is aluminum in itself. And so we need to reimagine transubstantiation as a kind of molecular move. And so what gets transubstantiated? Every single molecule. Mm -hmm. And now, this this attempt failed because other people said look bread's not a molecule you can't get a molecule you can't get a molecule of bread right within bread or wine you can get molecules of carbon or well let's say uh, atoms of carbon but you could get a molecule of alcohol for instance in, right. in the wine um but they said but that's that's not it you, you don't have an intelligible reality of bread and wine at the atomic or molecular level and so um you you've all we've done with our modern understanding of the deepest roots of the the physical uh, well we don't even have the deepest roots but where we've gotten with molecules and atoms um just pushes it back further but it doesn't actually answer the question what is bread in itself that that is still to to put it in in um philosophical terms that's still a metaphysical question not a physical question and anyone who tries to answer a metaphysical question as a physical question is just making a category mistake right right, right. But, like, but it's a category mistake people made uh when thinking about transubstantiation and 
contemporary like chemistry. Right, right. Like even two aluminum atoms, right? Like an aluminum atom in this soda can, an aluminum atom in that soda can, they'll, they'll actually be a little bit different, right? Like aluminum is the thing that we give that has X number of protons. Sorry for not remembering out there on the internet, the number of protons in aluminum right. and X number of neutrons, although then there could be different isotopes, right? And then right. The, the electrons, sometimes they'll have a charge and sometimes, you know, all the electrons will be in different positions for all of these different aluminum a atoms out there in the universe. So none of them two are the same, right? right. So the, even the category of aluminum atom is something that we are bringing metaphysically to these atoms to recognize the pattern that manifests itself that atoms that have such and such things in common that we'll call aluminum share properties and that that we can use that pattern recognition in our own mental metaphysics to start you know interacting with the world with that knowledge but aluminum itself is still something mental uh, that I'm not saying it's like merely mental, but that is exactly the sort of thing, like when you think about it, aluminum is a mental category. Well, that doesn't mean that it's not real. And right. then all of a sudden, that distinction, you start messing with that a little bit, even with modern science. And then you start understanding what's going on here when we're talking about transubstantiation a lot better. Right. And I think a Thomistic metaphysics would say that God has given intelligibility to creation. And us calling aluminum aluminum is us recognizing an intelligibility that is inherent in aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that, it's precisely that that we're doing uh, when we recognize bread as bread or wine as wine. Mm -hmm. And, and there's something real and intelligible that makes bread bread. Uh, and, it's, and that is, is the substance. It's what's present to the intelligence. Yeah. It is the yeah. intelligibility and so God can say with God's word, this is my body and alter at the deepest level, the intelligibility of what is being spoken about in a way that you and I can't. Mm -hmm. and, and so Thomas's primary analogy for transubstantiation is the doctrine of creation where God with his word makes things to be what they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think I think that's very good. So transitioning a little bit. So what do we think is going on in the Eucharist? Why? What? What can? What can we say about why is it? Why is it bread and wine? Why are we supposed to do this regularly in the context of a church? Why? Why did Christ um, instantiate this uh, institution? and stuff like that. What, what are we supposed to make of it? And, and kind of getting in the details of the sacramentality of, of the Eucharist in particular. Right. Oof, that's a big question. Someone should write a book. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, which is not to say my book doesn't, because my book is a very narrow slice, right? Mine is not a systematic theology of the Eucharist. It's a study mm -hmm. of one subset of that kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So to zoom out, um, I mean, one, one of the key things is Jesus, I mean, we, we look at what Jesus does, all right, we're recording this on Monday, Thursday, or Catholics mm -hmm. typically nowadays say Holy Thursday. Um, the institution of the Eucharist, this is, this is the scriptural locus where we start. And the, the thing to recognize is Jesus isn't arbitrarily taking bread and wine. He's taking a couple of loaded symbols from within his own Jewish heritage right so you you could spend uh a lot of time and it, someone like brant petre for instance who's written a book called jesus and the jewish roots of the eucharist does this kind of work um jonathan pajot who's a common yep. um guest uh, for for paul vanderclay uh, uh does some of this work in a video i was just listening to of his um of looking at bread and wine and sacrifice and the various sort of categories through the old testament that jesus is um, fashioning into the eucharist on holy thursday so you could look at melchizedek you can look at uh, cain and abel this is what pajot was talking about in the in the thing i just listened to where you have um uh, a sacrifice of a lamb and a sacrifice of grain and somehow the eucharist is actually both of those things 
it's a reintegration of that sacrifice that didn't go well, or at least half of it didn't go well. Um, um, you can look at the manna in the desert. Uh, mm -hmm. You can look at um, the bread of the presence that was in the temple. Um, you can look at... Um, and of course, various... Passover seders, right? Yesterday, last night was Passover. And right, that's perhaps the most the most relevant even connection. Yeah, so the Exodus 12 is the reading in our church tonight uh, for Holy Thursday, where the um, the Passover is like happens historically, but at the same time as God is giving the instructions for what you need to do to get through this night alive, right? Put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and 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 bake your bread fast. Mm -hmm. and hurt your yeah. loins because you're getting on the road at the same time that those instructions are being given the religious instruction for the commemoration of that event is being given simultaneous yeah to the to the saving action itself which is exactly what happens uh at the last supper for christians yeah. right Jesus is, that's a really good that's a really cool idea yeah yeah he's interpreting the saving action that's about to happen uh and if he doesn't by the way if jesus doesn't tell us at the Last Supper, what's happening on the cross, it's more bewildering. I mean, yeah. the, the apostles were bewildered by the cross, but but then when they could reflect on it later, they had categories from their own Jewish heritage about sacrifice and covenants and all that kind of stuff that they could apply to it, um, which he gives them at the Last Supper, right? So the yes. so bread and wine are not arbitrary. They are within a whole cultural religious um, uh, context mm -hmm. that, that we could study in great depth uh, right. and others have done it better than me and um, that's why it's important to say that it's not unsymbolic right we're not it, negating it, the symbolic yeah, right. right it is it is hugely symbolic richly symbolic but it's not just symbolic right 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 because right? you don't symbols you don't need to participate in so and this is something i was thinking about like eating and drinking like you know, that's something that you need to continuously do to be sustained, right? Like right. just in normal life, right? We need to eat food, we need to drink liquids, or else we die. And this is an ongoing need. And like, Jesus is pointing out like to the deeper meaning of food and drink, that that something even more important than staying alive is the food and drink that leads to eternal life, right? That That's part of the way they kicks off that passage in right. John 6 is that, you know, I'm giving you the bread and the wine that will lead to eternal life. You know, that, that food that I made you, that miracle where I fed the thousands was, you know, that was just regular food. Why are you guys coming to me back for that? That's, that's not the good stuff. The good stuff is yet to come, right? right. And it's this, this continual process. And Jonathan Peugeot talks about this, like the, even the symbolism of eating is taking something that's outside yourself, bringing it inside to yourself, and it becomes part of you now, right? You right. are what you eat. Right. And so so all of that is coming together in that that the the sacrament of the Eucharist is something that we ongoingly do that both symbolizes and even more than symbolizes, actualizes our becoming more and more like Christ in our lives right. in the here and now. And it's not something we do individually. It's something we do as a community and through the church. Right. It's, so it's so, all of that. I mean, Augustine has this great line where he says. I think he says he was it was in a dream or a vision where Christ says to him eat me but my food is so strong that instead of you turning me into your body which is what normally happens when you eat food mm -hmm. um I'm going to turn you into my body when you eat yeah. me, right so so there's this sense that, that that um this is where the body of Christ is fed and to feed a body is to actually make it right like like I have seven kids and a huge amount of my budget is dedicated to feeding them. And if I don't, I won't have seven kids. Right. Like, and, and I, I think like if you grew up in a culture where you're, you're regularly hungry or you live in a desert where you're regularly thirsty, you have an awareness of the depth of the symbolism of eating and drinking that is lost on on yes. you know, most of us. I've never been really hungry in my life. 
Mm-hmm. I, like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like I, I remember doing the 30 hour famine in, in mm-hmm. high school and like, yeah, you get pretty hungry around like the six, eight, 10 hour mark. And then you get past that and you can actually power through, you know, from about the 18 hour mark to the 30 hour mark, you actually, your body adapts and whatever. At some point though, your body goes into like panic mode yeah. and starts like eating itself. Right. Because, and it's all you can think about. Right. And it's all you can think about. And I've mm-hmm. never experienced that. And I don't know anyone I, in my acquaintance who has. Right. right? Like, Besides um, perhaps an especially ascetic person. Right. Right. Or like a refugee or, you know, like someone who's lived yeah. through some hell. I shouldn't say that. I did know someone who went through this. Um, and it's re- and I'll tell the story because because it's so outside of our experience that it makes the the point about hunger value. and and you know what this is actually important for um christians today right so one of the things we're doing all the time i work for the archdiocese is we're trying to communicate to people what it means that we can't receive the eucharist now because public celebration of mass has been suspended yeah. because of the pandemic and we're trying to say that that done well this should increase our hunger for the eucharist right so so for a for a group of people who most of us have never really been hungry, that's something. So here's the story. Um, and it came to my mind when I said, you know, someone who's been through hell, right? Like a refugee. Well, uh, there are people alive today, they're very old, who lived through World War II. Uh, and there was a young Polish, well, she's not young now, but there was a young Polish woman um, who was in my parish growing up. So she was a grandma by the time I was a teenager, but the story is from when she was young. And her, I think it was her and her brother. I may not get all the details right. Her and her brother are sort of walking through Europe after the war and trying to get somewhere where there's food, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, they they end up with like a bucket of potatoes, like old, like half rotten potatoes, right? And it's like, it's it's gold, you know? Mm-hmm. They haven't eaten in days. And they get these potatoes and she stays home, wherever home was. I don't even know if it was like a barn, like wherever they were sheltering, she stays with them on a given day and her brother goes out searching for more food or whatever. And her brother finds another person who's in the same boat as them, who's starving and looking for food and says we got potatoes like you should come back to our place and we can eat these potatoes together tonight and when he gets back um he says hey where are the potatoes uh like i brought this guy he's starving can we give him some potatoes and she had eaten them all she couldn't she couldn't she couldn't couldn't resist i mean she was she was starving to death yeah and she was at home for hours so she ate these potatoes and she was so ashamed Mm -hmm. that that someone had come to them for food and they thought they had food. At least one of them did. And they couldn't offer this person food because in her starvation, she had eaten like raw half rotten potatoes. Yeah. You know, and just, just to imagine the humanity of that situation and then think what it means that God is feeding us. Right. You know, like, like we don't, we don't, if you've never been close to starving, I've never been close to starving. The closest I can get is, is I know a good story about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you appreciate what's being offered here? Right. Yeah. And I think you touched on another really important aspect of this is being fed and sustained by someone, right? Like, you know, uh, I, I have one daughter, you have seven kids. We're, we're in charge of, you know, feeding our children and our children see us as the source of food. They look to us, they might not think about it very often, or well, maybe they do think about it actually pretty often, come to think of it, but looking to us, you know, as, as their, their source of food. And part of this, part of the symbolism, part of what's wrapped up in the Eucharist is us thinking of, of Christ as our sustainer, right? right? Our perpetual giver, who is the one that we go to continuously and trust in for food. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's something of like a, a kid parent relationship almost sort of in that. Right. Yeah. I had, I hadn't thought of that, but I mean, it, 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 it does make sense because, um, and, and when you're, when you're in a, 
a time of Eucharistic fasting, right? When, when you don't have access because there aren't public masses. Um, the sent, well, here's, and here's how a Catholic would think of it is also the church as mother, mm -hmm. right? So this is right. That the church gives us the sacraments. I mean, obviously Christ through the church. Um, but we think of the church as mother uh, that feeds us. That's, that's very common Catholic yeah. sensibility. And to not have access to the, the church's feeding of us at this time uh, is, is a kind of experience of, of starvation, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Man, I didn't even, I didn't even think of how, how the virus situation would connect into all of this. Right. So I, I wasn't planning on it, but it's it's like all of our messaging, you know, our social media, our preaching uh, is is like you can't just ignore that. Like you you gotta. Right. This is the pastoral situation that people are in, and we do have in our Catholic tradition this idea of spiritual communion, which is an interesting idea because it says that the grace of the sacrament is not tied to the sacrament. We are bound to the sacraments because they're a command from God, uh, which, I mean, you talked a little bit about that. That, is, that was almost the only reason you guys were doing them is you recognize God said to stand with them about why, he, you know, why God said that. Um, but God is not bound by them, right? So we're bound to, to obedience and we, we have a guarantee. That's a, that's a Lutheran sensibility. I mean, it's Catholic too, but Luther is very clear. God promised to be here for you in this. Um, but, uh, but we also say that God is not limited by that. And so, uh, so Catholics can say at the same time that, sac uh, that baptism is necessary for salvation. And also that the grace of the sacrament of baptism is available outside of the celebration of the sacrament. So we believe in, you know, we call it baptism of desire, right? If someone sincerely desires baptism, um, God will not withhold the grace from them because, mm -hmm. Oh, like the criminal on the cross next to Jesus. The or criminal something on the like. cross is the perfect biblical exemplar of this, right? But it applies to communion too, that we can make an act of spiritual communion and God can give us the grace of the sacrament. But, but we don't say uh, that that means you don't ever have to go to Eucharist. Right. Uh, what we say instead, and we say the same thing about confession, by the way, the Pope made this statement that got a lot of coverage in the media uh, last week about like, if you can't go see a priest during COVID-19, take your confession directly to God. And Protestants were like, we've been saying that for 500 years. Um, great idea, guys. <laughs> yeah, great idea. Thanks, Pope. Um, but the Pope actually wasn't changing anything in the traditional teaching. That's always been available. When, when the sacrament is not available physically, if you can't celebrate it in its normal way, the grace is available to those who, who really desire it. But part of knowing that you really desire it is that as soon as it's available, you will go seek it out. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't actually go to communion when it's available, if you don't actually go to confession when it's available, then what is that desire that you're yeah. leaning on in the times when it's not available? Because if you really desired it, you'd go, right? That's right. kind of the, the logic of the, the Catholic that makes sense. Uh, that makes you know, approach yeah. to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't find any fault with that. Um, so kind of tying back to the idea of what might Unitarians have to say to Trinitarians that could help, uh, help see some things. So I, I was thinking about this as I was reading through your book. Like, it seems like a common trap that kept being fallen into was the idea of Christ's real presence as being real in some literalistic materialistic and when literal is not the right word materialistic um you know this worldly kind of mm -hmm. way all right and and that that either that was obviously wrong and people would reject the whole thing or people would just accept what seemed kind of weird and like my like i said that's what my mom thought that she was taught right growing up right. what was physically that it is <laughs> you know, the, the, the body and the blood. And I think sometimes Trinitarians in understanding the incarnation are prone to something similar, right? The Trinity grew up in Platonic metaphysics. And in fact, actually, I would even go so far as to say that the Trinity helped influence Platonic metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that, I, that that would maybe even be a compliment to something. Like 
uh, a lot of Unitarians will say, I, you know, the Trinity just came when true Christianity started getting contaminated by Hellenized Platonism. And while I think that's kind of true, I think if you really study it, you realize that the, the Trinity and Christianity had a, had a huge influence on Platonism too. And that right. by the, the fourth and fifth century, Christian, um, you know, metaphysicians were more common than their pagan counterparts and were having a bigger influence. And even Plotinus, the, you know, had Neoplatonists probably had a decent amount of influence from, from the Christians in his area. Right. So, um, so as Platonism has sort of faded, we talked about the effect that it had on um, the Eucharist. I think that it has had something of a similar effect on the incarnation because the incarnation was originally very platonically understood and communicated. And that's right. what they were arguing about in those councils was trying to sort out all the details of how that worked. And so I think that when most Christians hear Jesus is God, they have something too this worldly, too materialistically true in mind that is something akin to thinking that um, that the bread and the blood or that the bread turns into the body chemically right like they have to imagine that that Jesus's mind is the same mind as like like some sort of mental psychological connection right where right. Jesus's mind is God's mind it's just God consciousness inside a human body or something like that when right. they understand Jesus is God, and that is actually similarly condemned as heresy early on, even though I think that's what most people can't help but hear now when you right. say Jesus is God. It's like, okay, so God is a person, he has a heavenly mind, and now that heavenly mind is here on earth in, a, in an earthly body, or something like that. Right. And that is not what the incarnation was teaching. Right. Yeah. So when I teach Christology, one of the big hurdles for a lot of people is Jesus's self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. so, so a common um, misunderstanding uh, when, yeah, you say Jesus is God, that means he's omniscient. Right. God is omniscient. And so then the Bible gets awkward at certain points, right? When Jesus is like, who touched my cloak? Yeah, where's Lazarus buried? Yeah, where's where, right? Whenever Jesus shows ignorance, then you sometimes you get these strange. Well, like he was just using that for like didactic purposes. He really knew, but he just asked, and like it, it seems a bit of a stretch. And then mm -hmm. there's other times where that won't even work, right? When 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 he's like, I don't know, only the Father knows. Right. That right. Um, if. If he if he really knew and he's just fudging on that one, that that's really tough to square, right? So right, and that deception problem is similar to the deception problem in the Eucharist. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that some people would say it, it's physically present, but we're being deceived from 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 recognizing it, right? Which Thomas has no room for that. Like he, there is right. no deception in the sacraments, according to to Thomas. But yeah, so oh, that I hadn't seen that parallel. So that's so when I teach Christology one of the major questions is how do we wrap our heads around the idea that Jesus is God and that doesn't mean he's omniscient in his human nature, right? Um, that Jesus was, was ignorant, self-professedly ignorant of certain things. And that part of what it means to be fully human is to, um, is to not know some things, to be, mm -hmm. to learn in space and time the way humans learn in space and time and yeah. not to just have constant infused knowledge of everything. Now there is in the Catholic tradition, there is a sense in which Jesus does have some infused knowledge. Um, and it's debated exactly how to understand that. But I think at, at the, at the limit, there's a sense in which he is experiencing the beatific vision uh, and has some uh, uh, infused knowledge of his relationship with the father. That's not the same thing as having infused knowledge about historical circumstances, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not, it doesn't mean he can read minds. It doesn't mean he, he can predict um, certain kinds of, you know, he's, he's not a, a Or he could answer any math question off the top of his head that you could ask right. him or we'll something. Speak like any that. language or, yeah. you know, th those, right. Like he could have, he could have told you E equals MC squared long before Einstein, right? Like they, 
That's not what it means, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I think a misapprehension that we have when we hear Jesus is God is to just attribute that kind of knowing, which, which doesn't square well with the scriptural witness, right? Right, right, right. And it's similar to that drift in metaphysics, where that's just the only way that that could make sense nowadays. And right. so, so I feel like things get complicated. So things that I will say about Jesus, right? Well, I will say that Jesus is the perfect image of the Father, right? Jesus is the, the image of the invisible God, right? To me, that's one of those verses that seems to distinguish them, right? But, but like seeing Jesus is like seeing this, the ne next best thing to seeing the Father, right? No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, he makes him known. He exegetes him, right? Like, and, and, you know, Jesus is all the time trying to get people to understand that the Father is in him, right? You can't see the Father, but when you see me, you see the Father, right? And, like, it's, it's the same, I, like, I think it's a very similar sort of spiritual sacramental scene that we're supposed to understand when we're understanding the Father in Christ as to understanding Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. I think it's something very analogous going on. And because that sort of thing gets broken and we don't, we have trouble articulating that or taking that as something that Jesus could have possibly meant, then you get stuck in this weird Apollinarianism, you know, God mind, Jesus body thing. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. I mean, when I said uh, that in a way that incarnation is a, is the primordial sacrament or that like that, that, highlight of that you know that it's that language that he who has seen the father or mm -hmm. who has seen me has seen the father is that like that's a great encapsulation of sacramental logic right that, right that something which is beyond our capacity to encounter because in our current situation as time and space bound beings um we can encounter if we could never get outside of time and space to meet God there. I mean, we could die, but I mean, in this life we can't. So God comes into time and space at our level. And right. so we can see God when we see, when we see Jesus. Right. And this is, this is like what I was saying where like when I read Athanasius, like when, if you read on the incarnation by Athanasius, the whole book is talking like this, right? Just goes through various things, you know, various stages of Jesus's life and stuff like that. And he's just, exegeting this, you know, very kind of sacramental vision into Jesus to understand the Father, right? And he, Athanasius very much thinks that that the Father is God. Like one thing that I would actually say is some, sometimes people don't realize that Athanasius's Trinity, he didn't think that God was a multipersonal being. He thought that the God, that God was the Father, and that Jesus was full of divinity. Jesus was God from God, true God, true from true God. But if you had asked Athanasius, wait a minute, aren't you a polytheist? He's like, no, there's one God, the Father. He didn't think that God was three things in one thing like, like that. It is is sort of a weird sort of way that people will misunderstand him if they read him later. And that's sort of what I'm talking about when I say I can, the earlier, the, the earlier the Trinitarian, the better I can understand what they right. mean. So I, I mean, I would, I'd have to go back. It's been a long time since I looked at Athanasius. I would have, because this is one of the things we, we tell people to be careful of. When I teach Trinitarian theology to my diaconate candidates, I say, be careful when you preach, for example, that you don't talk uh, that you don't just make the Father and God interchangeable so that it sounds like you're not saying Jesus or the Holy Spirit are God as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I... That's a very Augustinian thing to do, okay. is what I would say. And so when you I, go I, back in the East before Augustine, they're perfectly fine interchanging God and the Father. They just want to communicate that Jesus was a full recipient of God's divinity. Okay, so I, I would I would like to go back and and reread Athanasius with those lenses and see what mm -hmm. what what it what it looks like. Uh, I mean, I think I'm just trying to think. I think it's a quote from Athanasius that is is the um, 
when we're working on this divine knowledge thing and people are scandalized that Jesus is not omniscient, mm -hmm. it's actually a quote from St. Athanasius about how um, in becoming human, one of the things God leaves behind is omniscience. Um, and, and because of Athanasius' sort of towering authority, you're like, okay, if Athanasius said that Jesus is not omniscient, uh, then I guess that's legit, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it would be, it would be interesting to, to go back and read on the incarnation after yeah. my conversation and, with you. Yeah. And part of it is just translation stuff. Like in Greek, God can mean the person or God can mean quality or substance. Right. Okay. And so when, when Athanasius is saying Jesus is God, he's, he's not saying there's a person and Jesus is one of those persons. Right. He's saying Jesus is what Jesus is, is divine. Right. He's, as divine as God is, right? right. It's a well, it's a quality substance statement, not like a, a person a person statement. And, but if and, you ask him who God is, is the Father is the God, like when you use it as a personal way of talking. Right. Well, and that and now we're using the language of person. So some people might say, oh, you know, Athanasius is like from a Catholic point of view. This oh, it sounds like you're saying he's a heretic if he doesn't, but we're using person differently. And, and, and yeah, yeah. the word, the Trinitarian language of persons actually comes after yep. Athanasius, right? Right, right, right. And so, uh, and, and doesn't mean what we mean by person. So right. anyway, to my Catholic uh, listeners, don't get panicked if I'm not like, um, <laughs> saying, hey, listen up, you heretic. Uh, of course, Athanasius thought it was a person. I mean, we're using the word differently. Uh, than right, it, than right. But, but that distinction of, of Jesus is revealing something that's above himself in a certain sense. And like Jesus is a pointer to something beyond, right? I think that this is where we might disagree. Mm -hmm. This is where, where, where Unitarianism and Trinitarianism might meet odds in a weird sort of way that I don't disagree with Athanasius is that, that he is opening, it's like he's this, like the, the spiritual opening or a portal that helps you see to God who otherwise is invisible to us. Right. right. But he is not, he's not saying stop at me. He's saying, you know, keep going. Right. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm the door. I'm the gate. I'm not the final destination in and of itself. That, that is my father who I'm trying to tell you about. Well, and even, so we would, we would, we would say, um, Yes and no, right? We would say, on the one hand, we would agree 100% that Jesus doesn't stop at pointing to himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he clearly points to the Father. We, we even articulate our whole liturgical movement as um, through Jesus to the Father in the Spirit. And we're careful with our prepositions right. when, when we do that, right? That, 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 we are not able to worship God the Father properly, but because Jesus can and he joins ourselves to his body in the Eucharist, then we are brought into an act of right worship of God the Father through Jesus. And that happens in the ministration of the Holy Spirit, which is the bond of unity that keeps us together in doing this. So we, we, would, we wouldn't deny that um, directionality yeah as, as you might say and what you just said there i could agree with that this, this is the funny thing sometimes disagree like you said disagreements are often more superficial than substantial like yeah. we are going to the father through jesus in the spirit yep great <laughs> i'm fine with that and that's why i always want to ask and people disagree with me like okay what do you mean by that uh, because we may or may not disagree and well here's the thing we're going to disagree mm -hmm. um but I, my personal, um, I don't know, phobia is not the right word. Um, but it's very important for me that when I disagree with somebody, that I'm clear about what we're disagreeing about. Yeah, I, hate, amen. I hate disagreeing and then finding out that actually, you know, that was all just ships passing in the night and we didn't understand each other. Um, whether that's like inter-church stuff, whether that's like, academic debates about theology or philosophy or if that's like me and my wife yeah 
who are having a really hard time communicating on this issue, I'm like, we might disagree here, honey, but let's be very precise about where we agree and disagree. You know, I just, yeah. that's I, something about my upbringing. You could probably find <laughs> that it's made <laughs> hypersensitive uh, to that kind of thing. But it, it's interesting. I mean, that you would find our language about our worship, uh, which we see as explicitly tr Trinitarian. And the Trinity is all over our, our worship, right? I mean, we walk into the church, we make the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. And if you watch our, our hymnody and our prayer at the Eucharist, it's, it's Trinitarian, Trinitarian, Trinitarian. And still uh, the basic dynamic of it, you would say, yeah, that sounds right to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that, like, that's fascinating. Right, right. And I think part of the reason I, I'm like you, that I, I really suspect that there isn't as much disagreement as sometimes there seems to be. I've, I've spent a lot of time going to Trinitarian churches. I actually currently go to just a, a normal evangelical Trinitarian church. And like I, I've been doing things outside of Unitarianism in Trinitarian land since I was a kid. And it's always been my suspicion that there is way more agreement than either side seems to realize. Mm -hmm. um, well, first off, most Trinitarians don't know we exist, but those that do um, seem to think that they're, they're really, you know, if I can go and I can, the only trouble that I'll have in most Trinitarian services of an evangelical flavor is sometimes the song lyrics might not be stuff that I like. Right. right. There will right. be some more explicitly Trinitarian song lyrics. Very rarely they'll maybe recite the Nicene Creed or something like that. But most of the time, the sermons, the worship style, the, the emphases even, you know, reading from the Bible, all of it, it just seems like totally the same thing is going on, really. Right. I don't know how else to put it. And that there's, when this topic comes up, yeah, there are differences. Um, and like, I would never say God decided to come down to be Jesus, right? I, I don't think that's not how I imagine it. For the record, I imagine God's word is sort of an, an impersonal attribute. It's like his wisdom or something. And the okay. word becoming flesh is like a plan being put into action or, you know, like. Similar to how you answered my earlier question about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, right, but, right. Like the, the logos is part of God, right? It, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? The logos is like an attribute of God that's a little bit distinct, but also inside God. And Jesus isn't like that transformed into a human. It's like a blueprint that became a house or something like that, right? He's okay. like the full embodiment of the abstract idea of God's, you know, wisdom and God's word or something like that. So, so what I would say, and, and we're getting yeah. close to two hours here, but what I would say, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, as we approach wrapping up, when, when we, when we find, well, like when you say you go to a normal Trinitarian church and you don't find that much disagreement is, uh, I'm not surprised at that because my general experience of humans is that we, we, tend to have more agreement than we initially suspect. Something about our brokenness leads us to read more antagonism and more difference into certain things than are, than are actually justified. Part of it is, um, I think, our own need to identify. So we can identify who we are by saying who we're not, and that leads us to overdraw the lines between us and other people. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I find it, this is from Thomas Aquinas, and it informs the Catholic tradition immensely. The Catholic tradition, we like to say, we'll take truth wherever it can find it. So we're not surprised if Buddhists believe something true or indigenous spirituality has something to teach us or, or that atheists are right about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because human beings want to believe true things. Like nobody, nobody wants to believe false things. Mm -hmm. We end up believing false things because our knowledge is imperfect and there's all kinds of, you know, difficulties with, with figuring out what's true. But the human impulse to, to desire truth means that we're going to find it at least some of the time. Thomas says somewhere like nobody's ever totally, I'm really paraphrasing. Nobody's <laughs> ever really totally wrong. Yeah. 
like it's 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 actually like technically impossible to be completely wrong because there's always an intention to believe something true and so i think if we grant to our dialogue partners that basic human um capacity for and desire for truth and when when someone says something that sounds like bonkers to you uh you can say like what truth are they trying to say because they're at, they are like except in cases of like i don't know fraud or something <laughs> um people are trying to say something true and even in cases of fraud right even when someone is trying to lie to you then they're actually still relying on your capacity and desire for truth even in their attempt to subvert it they, yeah. like there's no getting around the human desire and capacity for truth and so I expect to find that something that on the surface looks really off or different, that there will be something in there. I'm, I'm still going to disagree with you at the end of the day about this or that claim, uh, but I expect us to be able to find things that we agree on and find insights about, and also uh, that we find more insight about our own positions by being forced to articulate them in conversation with an honest person who disagrees with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a perfect, excellent note to end on. So uh, with that, I will stop the recording.